we're going to finish up the I didn't even try the the head thing so I just I mean I'm 0 for 2 and I think Keith was 0 for 3 so we just scratched that all together and we're going hand mic and I do need to start by apologizing because last week I said something that wasn't very politically correct I thought I said it low about people with plates in their heads and Dennis I apologize but I had no idea that you had a plate in your head <laughs> but I just, so, sorry about that um, Dennis and I we go back a long way graduated together and just real quickly here I always have a vivid memory of Dennis from football practice and at Churchill with Churchill Elementary School Dennis was playing football uh, we were playing coach Christian was our coach we were doing a drill and I remember somebody saying Dennis is hurt and to this day I have no idea how his arm done this but Dennis raises his arm and it literally has a bow in it like this he wouldn't have said he just said coach I think my arms broke <laughs> And I'll always remember that, Dennis. That's one of those things that you just can't forget. Never, never, ever forget. I'm surprised I'll still continue playing football after that. We've talked about the history of the Bible. We've talked about the um, authenticity of the Bible last week. And, and I want to emphasize something to you. We've just kind of scratched the surface on these things. Okay, in the two hours that we've gone... And the hour tonight, we're really just touching on a lot of the proofs that are out there that go to the authenticity of the Bible. And tonight, we're going to talk about the accuracy of the Bible. Are there contradictions in the Bible? Um, th there's all kinds of information out there, and uh, I'm going to touch on that toward the end. But tonight, um, the subject is, um, does the Bible have contradictions? Okay, there's this assumption that because the Bible is old, that it must have errors. Now, talk political correctness, that offends me because I'm old. Well, and I do err, but, but there's this assumption out there that because something has age or there's antiquity to it, that it is inherently uh, flawed. And um, antiquity does not automatically imply that there's error. As a matter of fact, the age of the Bible and the content of the Bible are two completely different things. Okay, now we went through the history meticulously the first night. The first Wednesday night we started this series on the Bible. Um, and we, sh we, know we show that the Bible um, goes back in its writing 1,600 years. Okay, when God actually wrote the Ten Commandments for Moses onto stone. Okay, so that we know the Bible's old. Okay, but, but the content is a completely different issue. The Bible can be complicated, right? There's absolutely no, I don't think you're going to find anybody who's going to get up and say, oh, yeah, the Bible, man, that's easy to read. It's, an easy, it's not. It's a complicated issue. But now you have to put that into context, okay? Um, the story that's being told is a complicated story and covers, like I said, 1,600 years. So we are dealing with um, a complicated document that people have spent their entire lives, they've dedicated their entire lives to studying. So if you find something in the Bible that you find a little confusing, or if you find something in the Bible that you think, well, maybe, is that contradicting? That's not unusual. You're, you're not in a boat alone. Trust me. I think we've all probably run into that. One thing I can say is that there are no contradictions. There are no, no known contradictions between the Bible and the laws of nature. Now, Keith went over this meticulously in creation. I touched on it a little bit uh, last week in uh, authenticity. Um, you know, society has kind of built up this, you either have to have faith or believe in science kind of thing, and that's just, that's bunk. That's no good. Okay, you can be a Christian and believe in science. Absolutely, I, I'm I'm a huge fan of science. Okay, but we've created this air that you can't do both. Um, but the Bible and nowhere in the Bible are there contradictions with the laws of nature. But there's one exception. I said nowhere, but there is one exception. What would that exception be? Miracles. Okay, miracles. Now, why do we have miracles in the Bible? Anybody want to take a stab at that? 
while we have miracles in the Bible? Miracles in the Bible are performed for a specific purpose. Usually, they're performed to authenticate a message that's being given by God. We have numerous examples of that. Okay? Or there's a new message, um, or there's a new revelation. That's where you see miracles in the Bible. Um, so that's the only contradiction you have between the Bible and the laws of nature. And... Um, we serve a big God. So all of us here believe in miracles. So that's no surprise to us. But that's one problem that a lot of people have with the Bible because they don't believe they see miracles today that did the miracles really happen back then. Well, let's think about that. The children of Israel left Egypt, and they saw a miracle every single day. And they still had doubt. So this isn't anything new. Okay, this doubt in miracles. I mean, every single day, they seen a cloud of dust or pillow of fire. Um, they were fed from heaven, manna from heaven. They seen this and still, at some point in their journey, took it upon themselves to build graven images and worship, you know, something not God. So, not a new concept. I don't have my back wall. Let me ask you this. Would unexplainable contradictions in the Bible diminish the message of the Bible? Who believes it would? Does anybody believe it? Well, I won't ask you to raise your hand if you don't believe it It wouldn't, but because personally, absolutely. Um, the inerrancy of the Bible is foundational to, uh, to our Christian faith absolutely foundational and that's why it's in this essential series these things are essentials for Christians to know uh, there's examples of this in the Bible um, when the Sadducees were uh, trying to trap Jesus with a question in Matthew chapter 22 uh, he tells them he says uh, you're in error because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God right there Jesus himself is given validity to the scriptures you don't know this. You are in error of your thinking. Jesus repeatedly referred to the Old Testament in his ministry. Um, and in uh, Matthew 24, 35, Jesus famously says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. So he's telling us there that the Old Testament is, I believe in the Old Testament. I know the Old Testament to be true. I'm also telling you that what I'm saying is true, and that will never die. So, I think so. I think when you ask the question, uh, if there were contradictions in the Bible, would it diminish the message? Absolutely, I think it would. Now, here's one of those uh, counterintuitive arguments that you hear from people um, that say, well, okay, Jesus, God, okay, I, I could believe maybe the core of the message, but... You know, humans wrote the Bible, humans err, so therefore the Bible must be an error. Now, how many of you have heard this? How many of you heard somebody say this? I've actually heard that this week. Okay, I've actually heard that argument this very week. That because we're humans and we err, and because we wrote the Bible, then the Bible therefore must be an error. Okay, well, that's what skeptics would say. If you remember last week, and on your handout, I've emphasized again um, the point that skepticism is not critical thinking. Okay, this is not critical thinking. Um, this is just pure skepticism. Logic, which would be applied in critical thinking, would say this. God cannot err. The Bible is the Word of God. Therefore, the Bible cannot err. Okay? That's a logical argument. It's called a, a, a syllogism, which is a form of reasoning, and it's based on the fact that if the premise is true, then the conclusion must be true. Okay? Well, another principle applies here, too, and it's called the laws of non-contradiction. What this it basically does... If you believe, number one, if you believe that God cannot, cannot err, 
then you have to believe the last thing, okay? If you believe God can err, then therefore the Bible's not, is fallible. It's not, it's not a perfect document, okay? Both cannot exist at the same time. Either one has to be true or the other has to be true. It completely takes out that human element. There's no human element in this. Okay, if you believe that God cannot err, then that takes you to the fact that the Bible cannot be an error. Contradictions in the Bible, alleged contradictions, I should say, should say, are not a result of translation or copy mistakes. Now, we went through um, meticulously the history uh, in the first night, and we've seen that there are numerous, numerous men of God, um, Jerome, uh, Bede, uh, Wycliffe, uh, there were the, the Mesrites that basically dedicated their lives for 500 years, generations of them, to simply copying the Bible to make sure before the printing press, of course, that we had accurate copies. Okay, so contradictions, uh, the alleged contradictions can't be a result of translation or copy mistakes. As a matter of fact, and we talked about this too, the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in 1947 um, are basically solid, solid evidence that the consistency of the way the Bible has been translated and copied through the years has been consistent. So what we have that from the Dead Sea Scrolls that dates back to Jesus' time, and this is just the Old Testament now, what dates back to Jesus' time, and what we have today are within 98.5% of each other. Now, where you say, well, 1.5, that's, that's a margin of error. But that margin of error is only spelling. It has nothing to do with doctrinal issues. It may be a spelling or something like that. But nothing as far as doctrinal issues in the Bible have been shown to be inconsistent. That's 2,000 years. No other document, like I said last week, can, uh, can claim that. Contradictions or conflicts between passages of Scripture are always almost always a matter of translation or context. Wait a second, Tony, you just said it's never translation. Well, two different types of, of uh, translation here. What, what I mean by translation in this passage is that you may have a word in ancient Hebrew that there's not really a sufficient English equivalent for. Uh, and I apologize for not having an example of that because I meant to pull one up. But there are, exam there are examples of this. So a word in ancient Hebrew, what the Old Testament was originally written in, may have a similar word in English, but it may not have exactly the same meaning. Okay, that's what I mean by, by that. And then the other thing is context. And here's where the majority of alleged contradictions um, fall under uh, context. People not taking the complete context of the Bible when they read it. Um, I pulled up a few of these. Um, there are actually, web, and this is unfortunate, but there are actually websites from atheists and agnostics that are dedicated to pointing out these contradictions, okay? Uh, this is a contradiction. This is a contradiction. And I actually went to one of these websites and pulled out a few um, that I thought I would share with you tonight and show you where where uh, they're not putting things into context, okay? I, I don't know, can you see that back in the back? Can you see that pretty good, okay? Here is three different versions from the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John of Jesus' last words, okay? In Matthew, Matthew says, my, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus cries out loud and then yields up the ghost, yielded up the ghost. In Luke, uh, Jesus cries out, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he gave up the ghost. And in John, it is finished and he gives up the ghost. Okay? Is there a contradiction here? Does anybody feel like there's a contradiction here? 
I don't think so when you put this. Go ahead, Roger. Exactly. When you take it out of context, if you look at it just what it was his last words, okay? Um, the Bible's not videotape. It's not actual, you know, we don't have an actual transcript. It's, it's the perspective of these three men. It's the pers perspective of the three writers, okay? It's the perspective of John. It's the perspective of Matthew and Luke. Um, each one has a unique position um, or an exact, uh, a unique position on, on that aspect or that moment, but each is a, lar is a smaller piece of a larger picture, okay? So, no, there's no contradiction here. Um, yet, a lot of critics or skeptics of the Bible would point to this and say, well, I mean, this is a contradiction. Did Jesus say this, or did he say this, or did he say this? Well, chances are he probably said all of it. He probably said all of it. There's nothing in the four Gospels, by the way, and like I said, you know, we, we could have spent a lot of time on just that, looking at the four Gospels and the authentication of the four Gospels, how they were canonized, and these alleged contradictions between them. We, we could spend a lot of time on just that, uh, and I just pulled that one, but there's, uh, in all the works of the four Gospels, there's not one piece of, of Scripture that um, contradicts with one of the other Gospels. As a matter of fact, I talked about apologetics a little bit last week and how um, there are people, um, and I happen to be a fan of, um, who actually take the position that, let's look at the proof, let's look at the facts, okay? They're not trying to take faith out of it, but they're trying to give people, you know, ways to answer some of these questions that come up from a fact base stance. Uh, and, and one of the facts that's used, um, I think Lee Strobel uses in his, in his book, A Case for Christ, is that if the four Gospels read exactly the same, then what would people say? Well, there's collusion. I mean, think about a court of law, okay? If you go into a court of law and you have four people who witness the same thing, and they get up on the stand and they all tell exactly the same story, what's going to be in the mind of the jury? They were coached. They were coached to say this. There's collusion. If, on the other hand, those four people get up, tell the same story from their perspective with details that don't contradict each other, then you get a bigger picture of what's going on. So I personally think the fact that the four Gospels don't say exactly the same thing, give a smaller piece of a bigger picture, is is a validating argument, is a validating argument that these men knew Jesus very closely and they're telling their side of the story. Uh, here's another example I pulled off. Um, and we talked about this in my Sunday school class um, a couple of months ago um, when we were doing Matthew that there's two different genealogies for Jesus. Which is it? Is it the genealogy from Matthew, or is it the genealogy from Luke that is actually where Jesus comes from, okay? Now, I'm taking out of context, again, if you look at that, that could cause somebody a problem. They could say, well, does the Bible contradict itself? Well, what happens is in Luke, Luke starts at Adam, and he goes to David. Matthew actually starts at Abraham and goes to David. When they both get to David, one splits off, Luke splits off to David's son, Nathan, and takes it to Mary, and Matthew goes to Solomon and goes to Joseph's side. Well, why would he do that? Why would we have two different genealogies for Jesus in the Bible? Is that not confusing? Is that not a contradiction? Why would they do that? Okay, well, you put it into context and you see that Matthew was a Jew writing to the Jews. And some of the Jewish tradition came into his writings, and there's examples of that. As a matter of fact, there's plenty of those. One of them that uh, went over with my Sunday school class is that Matthew, if you'll read in his gospel, when he talks about the kingdom of God, he refers to it as the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God. Okay? 
a little Jewish tradition there coming out in Matthew because to the Jews, the, the very name of God was holy. They didn't say it. So Matthew is paying respect to that. Well, here in the genealogies, he's doing the same thing. Okay? We all know Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus. We all know that. As Christians, we accept that. But the Jewish tradition, it was important to see the man's side of it. So that is why Matthew takes it through Joseph and Luke takes it through Mary. Now, there's another reason. Um, if you read through the genealogy, and, and I'll be honest with you, um, I studied this not two months ago, and when I pulled this one off of this athe atheist website, that they were saying, oh, here's, here's a contradiction, explain this one, and got to studying it, I found something new. And that's what I love about studying the Bible. There's always something new you can find. Um, there's another reason. Um, in Joseph's genealogy, there is a man named Jokaniah. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Is that right, Derek? Jokaniah? Jeconiah. Okay. And Jeconiah um, was a king, and um, he did some bad things, and God cursed him. God said, no one will sit on the throne of David from your descendants. Okay. He's in Joseph's line but Joseph's not the biological father of Jesus so the curse doesn't carry through so I mean you, you look at these small things of God's plan and it's just it just and when I saw that I'm like wow I never had seen that before another little interesting piece about Jeconiah Jeconiah they've actually found recently evidence of his kingdom of, of his of his reign uh, I think there's actually a, maybe a piece of, uh, of, of uh, a coin or, or some type of money that has his picture on it, uh, archaeological evidence that what's in the Bible actually happened, you know, thousands of years ago. Just a little side note there. Um, so that's why you have two different genealogies in the Bible. It's, it's not a contradiction. There's two different reasons for it. My favorite story... Uh, one of my favorite stories, especially as a kid, it was definitely my favorite story, was Noah and the Ark. I told you my story um, from college the first night I was up here and how, you know, seeds of doubt were planted with me. Well, this is one of the very things, it's one of the reasons I pulled it off the website. This is one of the very things that were told to me that got me doubting, was the Bible actually accurate? How many animal kind did Noah bring on the Ark? Has anybody heard this one, this contradiction? Okay, um, I have, and you know, 20 some years ago, I, I didn't have enough, well, I'll say I didn't have enough forward to, but I, I didn't have um, enough knowledge to say, you know, is that a contradiction? I mean, it looks like in one part, God's saying bring seven, and in one part, he's saying bring two. Let's take a look at it. Now, that one is going to be hard to read. Um, so I'll read it for Josh back there in the back with his. Um, in Genesis 6, he says, Of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark. Keep them alive with you. You should bring male and female. Okay, now when we teach this Bible story um, to, to our young people, that's usually the image we get. Usually... Um, the toys that we sell, biblical toys. I, mean, I think I actually had uh, one of these. That, you know, you had two. You had you know, a little male line, a little female line, you know, and you marched them into the ark. Um, that's what it says in Genesis 6. But in Genesis 7, you shall take with you of every clean animal sevens, seven pairs, male and female. Is this a contradiction? Exactly. A man of logic in the congregation. That's exactly right. But skeptics will tell you, well, what is God saying? Is he saying bring seven? Or is he saying bring two of each kind? What is he saying? Just like Mark just pointed out, it's not a contradiction at all. Because if you bring seven, naturally you're going to have two. God's message here is make sure when you're sacrificing and you're having dinner 
make sure you leave two, uh, one of each kind, okay? That's all God's saying here. But if you look, if you look at it initially and you let the skeptics get to you, of course, it looks like there is a contradiction. But and I, and I, like I said, there are a number of these. Uh, I was, um, I, I don't want to use the word hurt. Uh, I was embarrassed. I think that's a better, better word to use. When I pulled up this website, first of all, I was embarrassed that I was on this atheist website, to be quite honest with you. Um, but, you know, part of being diligent and researching. Um, but as I looked through the list and seen some of the arguments from their skeptical point of view, not critical thinking, skeptical point of view, I mean, it, it was embarrassing. It's like, do you understand what you're reading? Now, you could find argument. I mean, you know, we, we can all... Um, now, I'm not going to make that comment because I've already been in enough trouble with my wife. Some people could argue anything, okay? <laughs> Some people could argue anything. If I mentioned about how much I appreciate the nursery, nursery workers tonight, <laughs> I got that in last week. Um, some people can argue abs absolutely anything, but being skeptical about something and argumentative about something, again, that is not critical thinking. Critical thinking is breaking it down and looking at what the facts present. What does the actual context, what do the facts show? Um, that is where uh, a lot of times you see arguments about contradiction. Um, that's where they're coming from. Here is... Uh, Here's a question about alleged contradictions, and it comes to uh, interpretation, okay? Um, how do we explain the numerous different interpretations when it comes to the Bible? Anybody heard this argument? Well, the Bible can't be right. Look at all the different interpretations you have. Well, interpretation and translation are two completely different things. Okay, translating something brings the meaning with that verse, that word, with you from one language to another language. Okay, interpretation, that's a human problem. That's a man problem. Okay, that's not a God problem. That's a us problem. Okay, so that's how I would answer that, is that, you know, um, the Bible uh, doesn't have a lot of interpretations. The Bible's the truth. There's one truth. Now, we've kind of messed that up a little bit, okay? But again, that's, that's an us problem, not a God problem. Um, I'm kind of flipping through your handouts if you're going along. Um, the, the first one was, because the Bible is old, there's an assumption that it must have errors. And uh, down to number three... Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were evidence of consistency and accuracy. When you talk about skeptics, um, usually skepticism, when it comes to contradictions in the Bible, you can usually lump them into one of three categories. Okay, The first category is doctrinal contradictions. And this is what that would look like. A skeptic would say that there are verses in the Bible that are confusing or contradict exactly the nature of God and Jesus. An example of that would be in John uh, chapter 10, verse 30, where Jesus tells us that he and the Father are one. Okay? But then in John 16, 28, Jesus says... I came forth from the Father, I came into the world, I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. So the skeptic would say, okay, is Jesus and God one or are they separate? It's a contradiction. Um, and this, again, is another argument I've seen on, on an actual website. Um, and that gets into... Uh, the Trinity, and we're going to talk uh, more about the Trinity in, as Derek does God, and then we'll do Jesus and the Holy Spirit about how those three, three things come together. That's a very complicated subject. 
I mean, it's complicated for theologians who do this for a living, okay? Um, but it's accepted doctrine for us as Christians that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one. Now, when you ask a question about Jesus, okay, you actually have to ask two questions. Are we talking about Jesus the Son or Jesus the man? Because if you say, did Jesus ever get hungry? Well, in heaven, as the Son of God sitting at his right side, the answer is no. But as a man, yes, Jesus did get hungry. Okay, so there is a separation there. Jesus made the decision to come be a man for us. Okay, this is not a contradiction. Okay, but it's a hard concept for some people to grasp. And um, sometimes it's, you know, fodder for people who want to argue that the Bible has doctrinal contradictions. The other one, uh, one of the other three is uh, ethical contradictions. Um, one of my favorite ones here is, um, and, I, and I've heard this one quite a bit, um, is slavery. Um, that's one of the first things you'll get from an atheist or an agnostic when they start talking about the Bible. What about slavery in the Bible? What about slavery in the Bible? There's a contradiction there. Well, is there? Is there a contradiction about slavery in the Bible? Because unless I'm missing it, nowhere in the Bible does it say you can't have slaves. Now, you put that into context, slave, slavery in the Bible exists for one of three reasons, okay? Number one, you were a conquered people, okay? Wait, man, that's fact of living in a fallen world. Number two is you owed somebody money and you became their slave to work off that debt. That was the second reason for slavery, okay? And the third reason for slavery was by choice because you were so poor that in order to avoid starving to death, you agreed to become somebody's slave and you would work so that they would feed you and house you. Okay, that's the three reasons in the Bible that you're going to find for slavery. Um, so there's no, et there's no ethical contradiction here. There's another reason there's no ethical contradiction here because the Bible doesn't say anything about not having slaves. As a matter of fact, there are several passages in the New Testament. Paul to um, the Corinthians in his letter says, you know, <laughs> If you're born a slave, I'm sorry, but be happy and try to be a good slave. If you can buy your freedom, then buy your freedom. Okay, he doesn't say that it's wrong to be a slave. Okay, he just says try to make the best of the situation you're in. So there's no ethical contradiction there for, um, for slavery. Um, another ethical contradiction they want to try to point to is judging, judgment. And, oh, boy, we've all heard this one as Christians. You know, well, you're not supposed to judge. The Bible says you're not supposed to judge. And I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a little smart aleck in me. My sister better not say amen sitting back there. There's a little smart aleck in me. And when somebody says that to me and says, the Bible says not to judge, my natural reaction is like, where? Can you give me that passage? Because I know they can't. I know it's there, but I know they can't give it to me, okay? That's a me problem. I understand that. It's like the Oprah thing from last week, okay? That's a me issue. But um, where is it? Well, it is in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, uh, we are told not to judge others lest we be judged. We're all very familiar with that. Then in John um, 7, 24, God tells us not to judge according to appearance. So... Is there an ethical contradiction there on judging? Okay, uh, the skeptics would say yes. Uh, you know, uh, you're given by, by making it vague, you're leaving out the fact that God tells you not to judge at all when in John you're told not to judge according to appearance. Well, that's semantics, okay? I'm sorry, that is just strictly semantics. And, and, and again, sometimes we throw common sense out with this because common sense isn't commonplace, as we all know. In Matthew, judging is talking, they're talking specifically about judging someone's salvation in Matthew, okay? Whether someone is saved or not. In the other verse in John, 
and judging is talking about not being quick to judge somebody based solely on their looks or their actions. Okay, so it's two completely different contexts and therefore not a contradiction and definitely not an ethical contradiction. The last category that these alleged contradictions will fall in is uh, probably the most difficult one, and that's uh, historical contradictions. Um, for years, years, um, you had this outcry. Well, David, patriarch of the Old Testament, um, you know, in the bloodline of Jesus, king, where's the proof? Where's the proof that David, you know, actually was this king, had this this kingdom, uh, and for years we didn't have the proof. Actually, it didn't make it any less true. We just couldn't prove it. Well, you know, that's changed. You know, uh, in the past uh, 40 years, you know, there have things been uncovered through archaeology that show that, um, you know, David did actually um, exist um, and have a kingdom. Um, but like I said, the, the the historical contradictions are probably the most difficult because, I mean, you're dealing with old stuff. Can you take the Old Testament and can you prove every story in the Old Testament based on things that have been found through archaeology? No, you can't. You, I mean, you're talking, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But I can tell you this. There's not been one piece of archaeology discovered that contradicts what's said in the Old Testament. While we find things that support what is being said in the Old Testament, and even the New Testament, even the New Testament, you won't find anything that contradicts what's there. So basically, that's the three categories of contradiction um, the arguments of skeptics would have they would fall under. Um, like I said when I started this, we, we all go through this. We all go through these periods of reading the Bible. The Bible is very complex. Um, do we understand everything about the Bible? I don't think the smartest person to ever live uh, understands everything about the Bible. Even though it's for us, God is infinite, eternal. Okay? Um, you want to talk about a translation problem, jumping that gap between us and God is a big gap. And the, and the Bible, like I said in my first night, the Bible is not God's autobiography. It's our story for salvation. It's our story for redemption. And even though people through thousands and thousands of years have studied the Bible, there are still things there that we can't, we just can't answer. Okay? We'll get the chance one day to ask the question, if you've got, a, you know, if you've got one about the Bible, that can't be explained. But uh, not everything to this point is explainable. I will tell you this, though. If somebody comes up to you and says one of these things that we've heard, uh, tonight, uh, well, the Bible was written by man, so thus, you know, it, it must be uh, in error. If somebody points out to you a biblical verse and says, well, this says this here and this says this here, uh, my advice to you is, um, first of all, God gives us the Holy Spirit to help us read the Bible. Okay, a wonderful, wonderful gift that we have. Um, as you look at these things, be diligent, and do the research yourself. There are a number. We, we live in the age of information, and there are a number of sources. Uh, when you run across one of these things, if somebody comes up to you and says, um, well, you know, I read in the Bible, it says this here, and it says this here, you may not have the answer, but I promise you, you can find the answer very easily with just a little bit of, of research on your own. Uh, there's a couple of websites that um, that I like to use. Like I said, I, I like apologetics. So one of them is um, carm.org, which um, stands uh, for uh, Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, and they actually have a list of these contradictions broken down by book in the Bible. Um, I did find a couple that was on the Atheist website that wasn't on the uh, CARM website. But that's a great source, uh, allabouttruth.org out of Colorado Springs, um, a great source on the Internet. There are a number of books. Uh, pastor, you know, we have a pastor who's very knowledgeable about the Bible. Um, ask him. Call him up. Ask him. Ask your Sunday school teacher. Okay, they may not have the answer right there on, on the spot, but I promise you they're going to go and they're going to find out for you, and they're going to get back to you. I brought a couple of books that, 
that I'm reading currently, um, one is called, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Um, it was writ written by Dr. Frank Turek. Uh, and it, this is an apologetics book. And the other one I referenced, I referenced last week that's called The Ten Most Common Objectives to Christianity. There's some good arguments in books like this, too. So really, you know, there are no contradictions um, in the Bible that can't be explained um, if you just do a little bit of research. Now, we have just a few minutes left, and in that time, I promised that I would cover translations, okay, modern translations. We went all the way up to the King James Version of the Bible uh, in our history segment, so I just want to touch on modern translations, and I want to tell you that modern translations, today's translations of the Bible are extremely accurate. Why is that? We have more information today. We have things like the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, we have things like these codexes that have been found that are hundreds of years old that, that help um, with uh, the translation of the original text. Um, when you talk about modern translations, uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls really caused an explosion of these modern translations. There's really three categories um, that they fall under. Dynamic, verbal, and paraphrases. And I'm just going to touch on this real quickly. Uh, a dynamic, equivalent modern translation, there's an emphasis on the functional meaning of the original text, but there's a freedom to move the words around so that they're more comfortable in the target language. It's called syntax, okay? Um, if you've had a foreign language, you know that not everybody speaks English the way we speak, and definitely not the way we speak here in East Tennessee. Sometimes adjectives are before the noun, sometimes gerunds aren't used, things of that nature. There's differences in languages. What this does, the dynamic balance does, is um, it gives, you take the words, and you just kind of rearrange them, same words, same meaning, okay, you just kind of rearrange them to be more comfortable in the target language. Then there's an verbal, a verbal equivalent, which tries to keep the words in the exact same order. Okay, it's a little more stringent. Then there's a paraphrase, um, which basically is the emphasis on uh, expressing the overall meaning of what, um, what is being trying to be said in contemporary language. Um, real quickly, some examples of modern translations that are dynamic equivalents are the Good News Bible, the New American Bible, and the New Living Translation. Some examples of verbal equivalents, no, and, and I'm just going to say this too. There's no preference here, okay? I mean, there's there's no one's more accurate than the other. It's just a matter of how things are being said. Nothing's being changed in the Bible in any of these in any of these books. Uh, verbal verbal equivalents: the Amplified Bible, the English Standard Version. This was the equivalence that the King James and the New King King James were translated under, and the NASB. For um, Oh, by the way, the NIV is actually a hybrid between verbal equivalents and dynamic equivalents. Um, and for paraphrases, the Living Bible, the Message, and the Voice. I promised somebody I would cover that, so I have done that. Um, so we started by asking the question, can Christians trust the Bible? Um, and I think this is a question that transcends um, all three nights, all three Wednesday nights. We took a look at the history um, very meticulously, um, how the Bible's been brought to be into our language, to this book that I can hold up here, but I didn't have all this stuff on top of it. Um, to this book right here I hold in my hand. We talked about the history, how we got here. Uh, last week we talked about the authenticity, why you can believe that what is written here was what was originally inspired by the men who penned it. Um, and tonight we've talked about um, the accuracy, that there are no contradictions here. There is an inerrancy about this book. It, it stands up to the test, and you don't have to worry about that as a, as a Christian. So I will now 
if there are any questions, um, I've kind of pushed up against time. Well, I actually went over my time. Oh, by the way, I hope everybody noticed, including my wife, that I had my watch on. And I did not sing tonight, so I met both my criteria tonight. Uh, that was my criteria. Um, are there any questions about anything we've covered in this series on the Bible?